we'll begin. I want to welcome everyone. Um, this is a, a special event, and I'd like to welcome people who made their way here on a very pleasant Friday uh, afternoon in Washington. It's not a, the best time for a meeting, but um, looking around the room, I see there's a lot of interest in the topic of health cities and post-conflict environments. Um, this is a session which will reflect a discussion that we've been having for the past two days with a working group convened in conjunction with Colgate University. And I would like to thank uh, Dan Monk and Nancy Reese and our Colgate colleagues and the members of the working group. Uh, and also I want to thank uh, Lauren Hertzer and Allison Garland uh, of CUSP for all the work that they, they do for the program. Uh, this session is also jointly sponsored with the Environmental Change and Security Program, and I want to thank uh, Gib Clark and Jeff DeBelco uh, for their help uh, with this event. I think those of you who know uh, about cities uh, and the state of the world and the state of, uh, sort of the urban population know that about half of the world's 6.6 .6 billion people now live in urban areas. And this could, number could grow to, to 5 billion in the next two decades. Most of this growth is going to take place in unplanned and underserved informal neighborhoods in cities around the world. So we have surging populations that are overwhelming urban ecosystems and overwhelming the capacity of all levels of government to meet the challenges of this new reality. So it's pretty clear that the context for any discussion of either conflict or health in the years ahead will have to include a serious examination of the urban and the urban environment. To understand that, the conjunction of these factors, I think we have two excellent speakers. Their goal is to both say a little bit about the discussion we've just had so that those of you who more participants in it will have an idea of, of, of how some of the, uh, how this program has come together. Uh, and, and then uh, we also hope that this session will stand on its own uh, feet, as it were. So we're going to hear from two speakers. Uh, the bios have been passed out, but for people who are watching online, uh, Dan Monk holds the George R. and Myra T. chair in Peace and Conflict Studies at Colgate University. He's also a professor of geography. He's a former Woodrow Wilson Center fellow. Uh, Skip Burkle is also a former uh, Wilson Center public policy scholar. Uh, he is, is currently a senior fellow with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and a visiting scientist at the Harvard School of Public Health. Both of our speakers have extensive publications, numerous honors, and have been involved in both uh, in a Wilsonian way in the world of ideas and the world of public affairs. Uh, so uh, they, can, they will both talk about some of these issues at a conceptual, more abstract level, but also bring the conversation down to the reality of place and time and real life consequences. So the format will be, we'll hear from Dan first to say a little bit about the workshop. Then we'll hear from Skip, and then I think Dan will have some comments. And then um, after that, the first question has already been submitted by Jeff DeBelco, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but he wanted to be sure that, that our speakers are, are suitably challenged. So uh, he, he submitted a que the first question. So with that, Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I actually <coughs> didn't know I was speaking. I thought that that uh, Blair was introducing the introducer to <laughs> Skip. So I, I'm going to follow that, that, uh, that model simply by telling you a little bit about how this project that we're working on arose and where we think it's going. Uh, when I was at the Wilson Center, um, uh, and I apologize to the participants in the working group for repeating things they've already heard, but when I was at the Wilson Center, I, a lot of uh, my colleagues and I attended many of the sessions like these in which uh, uh, extremely knowledgeable people spoke about post-conflict conditions in various parts of the world. Some of them were 
public health experts. Some of them were area studies, uh, uh, held area studies expertise. Some of them were international relations and foreign policy professionals. And what many of my colleagues and I would start to talk about once we went to the lunchroom after, after these, these meetings was the fact that um, what was not being addressed was the way in which uh, the various disciplines, fields of expertise that are authorized to speak about the post-conflict environment actually constitute their object. And you're all familiar with this in a slightly, probably less abstract way. Uh, you're all familiar with the fact that at a previous moment in history and to some degree even in the present, uh, the ways in which certain agencies and organizations define refugees creates refugees. And so uh, simply because the preconditions for aid are crossing a border, then the pe people operationalize that reality, and then at some level a new situation is created. The very definition of the situation participates in its creation. And this is very exactly the kind of phenomenon that we wish to examine in the working group by um, bringing together a number of scholars who are uh, looking at those principal uh, fields, uh, the, uh, and, and principally in the areas of stability, peacekeeping, nation-building operations, transitional justice frameworks, international humanitarian action, international humanitarian law, uh, reconstruction professionals, and really looking at the ways in which those fields at some level frame the post-conflict environment on their way to going about attempting to change it. Um, we think it's an important exercise in the sense of providing a kind of feedback loop to policy intellectuals about the ways in which they don't really stand apart from their object of study, but at some <laughs> level in beginning to actually describe what it is and acting upon it, at some level participate in its perpetuation. Uh, a lot of the cases that we've examined in the last two days really focus and highlight that reality, the ways in which a bunch of really well-intentioned intentioned professionals are caught in a kind of frame trap that permits them to, at some level, exacerbate the conditions they would attempt to ameliorate. Um, so at present, that's where we are. We have a number of cases uh, stemming from uh, Iraqi Kurdistan to Bosnia, Herzegovina, and other locations. And uh, it seems that we've made pretty good progress towards um, uh, moving forward with this volume, which we hope uh, we'll all get to see in another you know, year's time. And perhaps we'll have a launch here at the Wilson Center, if we're lucky. I, I just, uh, before I close, I just wanted to mention two last quick points, the first being that uh, speaking for Colgate University, I'm delighted that we've had this opportunity to collaborate with the Wilson Center, and I hope it's going to be the first of many such projects, and that I'm particularly delighted that we've, had, that we've been able to combine the resources of the various programs at Wilson and Colgate so that we could have someone like Skip addressing our, our group. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Well, Dan, thank you. And uh, I'm from Hawaii, so aloha and mahalo for inviting me, and I'd certainly like to thank up front uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center and and Colgate University for sponsoring and inviting me and having this uh, important topic. Um, other than the bio, I think I just need to tell you that uh, I've pretty much spent my entire life either in war or whatever follows war. Um, and unfortunately, too often, returning to places uh, years later that had been previously at, at war and, and are again at war. Uh, very much is like Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill in Hades. Uh, but I was telling the group earlier today that, that back in actually 1992, I um, put together two talks on post-conflict environment, used them for maybe about six months to a year and put them on the shelf because uh, we were anticipating we were going to be in the business of a lot of post-conflict, but it turned out that we just went right back into conflict after conflict after conflict. So I brushed them off and looked at them. They were actually the old 35 millimeter slides. We didn't have PowerPoints at the time. And uh, a lot hasn't really changed. The reason why we're talking about it now is this is the first opportunity, uh, for, uh, quite honestly, the first time that we've had less declared wars than we have post-conflict countries. So we have a tremendous opportunity. But it also means that, gee, we better go back and um, 
and figure out what this animal is all about. What is this post-conflict environment? And so I'm going to uh, start with telling you what some of the current research is, not yet published, but I don't think you'll be surprised by our findings um, about this term post-conflict and have you think a little bit more outside the box. And also, what role does health play in this? Because uh, I was the only health person this last two days, although all the multidisciplinary is certainly the approach to uh, trying to solve our major problems in this post-conflict environment. We didn't do it very well in the conflict end of it, but it certainly is part of the solution. Uh, and it is interesting, too, many of the fantastic speakers in the last uh, two days did speak about health. The interesting thing is that when it comes down to measuring things, whether it's in the economics or communication or transportation or governance, uh, whether it's during the war time or post-war uh, time, uh, they all use health indices. And we can talk a little bit about that later, uh, the reason why, but it seems to be the most sensitive group of health of indices to measure success or failure. Um, so with that, uh, and, and I do want to, um, I will talk at the end, I don't have any slides on it, but I'm going to talk to, uh, about what we are concerned about, which is we feel is the next major humanitarian crisis, which is going to be coming out of the mega cities. Just want to be sure that you understand something about that, because we are not prepared. We're not prepared to defend the public health and cities um, that are expanding about a million every six months and uh, have no public health infrastructure at all. So they have no capacity to handle uh, any emergency. And it's getting worse right now because uh, they were able to um, obtain monies from the coffers of some of the outsourcing that had gotten to the mega cities to maintain the public health uh, systems, facilities, hospitals in these cities, but now with the financial crisis that's gone south. And so we are getting all the sentinel proxies, the indices, that that is becoming more and more troublesome by the day. I want to tell you what we did. Uh, we went ahead and we took a number of databases, uh, and there are a number who are look at uh, um, conflict and post-conflict situations. Uh, we used 16 uh, sources um, and coded them primarily based on fatalities and, ca and casualties to resource depletion all the way through adverse changes that are seen in the social psychology and political culture of the affected uh, social identity groups that are in, in these environments. Um, and primarily uh, what we found, which all these databases primarily used uh, something from zero to ten, zero meaning that there was no conflict at all, ten meaning, quite honestly, um, beyond belief. The highest uh, number we found was a seven, and that was Rwanda, and you remember what your Rwanda was like. So we pretty much collapsed them in from both sides, and so we just came up with, with uh, one to seven, because honestly we found none of the countries that we studied ended up being 162 countries that at least have a population over a half a million um, uh, currently uh, that are, have some issues with post-conflict um, that didn't have some conflict. Uh, so it's a, a little bit different than what some of these uh, um, databases themselves shown. So we've taken it in a, in a, different, in a different direction. But one of the things we found out, lessons learned right from the beginning, is that we have a lot of groups, even in the U.S., whether it's State Department, Department of Labor, and other, who, who assess uh, other countries and conflict and different issues there, but you really have to put them aside and look at how uh, the conflict is being um, defined, not by global queries, but by the countries themselves. And what we do know is that when conflict declines, there's obviously an increasing population left behind that's exposed to declining levels of high risk and high stability environments. And I was telling the group uh, earlier today, I, I just uh, have not for a long time called them post-conflict, but here I am giving talks on post-conflict, but I talk about them as environments short of war. 
because I think that the term post-conflict has lulled us into a certain degree of thinking uh, that is very dangerous, that, okay, there's something good going on and maybe they can take care of themselves, but it is a monster beyond belief. And from the health side, which obviously I'm going to talk to you about, it is much, much worse than during the conflict itself, during the war itself. It really is. There's a strong trend, obviously, for more people being exposed now to risk of lower levels of intensity. We come up with great terms, don't we, than ever before. But certainly right now, we have more people living in recent conflict environments than in conflict environments. And so that's the new thing. That's the, the new situation. So you're not surprised at all by, by this um, graph that shows essentially on the right-hand side that there's um, uh, <clears throat> more people there exposed to conflict than, uh, than deaths, so suffering from the chaotic elements of war. That doesn't mean that there isn't deaths going on. And the trouble is, is that we don't, uh, do not have the means to collect those deaths. We just don't get them. Okay? During wartime, we've got a lot of people arguing about who's, who's uh, tallying them up, don't they? I'm part of that group that <coughs> did the, uh, was involved in the Iraq mortality study. So you know the issues from, from uh, Johns Hopkins and the stress and strain about documenting that. But what are we talking about from those levels of one to seven? We're talking now in 2000, eight and nine, uh, 400 million people that are living in some degree of lower intensity conflict than war itself. So if we take this data and we look at the end of the conflict, and actually we, we take the, the end of that year that the conflict ended, and add five years to it, you can see over again on the right, and the light color, the white really is level one, one and two, all the way up to seven, uh, that there's among those 400 million people, um, uh, you can see the levels of, of conflict within those non-conflict or post-conflict environments. It has every single extreme still going on, but you just don't hear about it. There's not a lot of public press about it, and, uh, and we get lulled into, okay, going on to the next war, so to speak, not having done a very good job with what we left behind. So actually, all conflicts have some level, all countries have some level of conflict. There's really no true post-conflict uh, environment, and really the uh, difference between populations at war and post-conflict uh, is getting blurred with this low level of uh, conflict intensity. It uh, doesn't mean there is peace out there, uh, that's for sure, especially if we listen to the people who are in that environment. Um, and, and this comes out in our own arguments. Uh, you know, I'm part of a civil military study group for USAID, we just finished up, but a big part of what we had to deal with, and you know, who, who owns that environment there, is it uh, the military or the civilians out there, the NGOs, uh, UN agencies, whatever? But uh, it starts with, well, you know, if it's a non-permissive environment, the DOD owns it. And then how about a permissive environment? Well, you know, that's changed. And now the new term is, well, you know, we really have these semi-permissive environments. Well, what in God's name does that mean? I mean, it really is symptomatic of what I've just told you, all right? And we'll probably come up with a, a bunch of other terms also to define uh, locally or countrywide, uh, you know, what is this situation we're dealing with. If we take the post-conflict not plus five years, but post-conflict plus ten years, uh, you can see that the, there's still a lot of levels going on there. That big peak on the, on the left-hand side um, so, we're, we, again, we've taken episodes from 1949 to 2008, but uh, that's Germany, post-Germany and post-Japan uh, situations, which um, uh, we're not talking about. But we still begin to, we still refer back to them as sort of the model. Well, it's a dream model because situations are much, much different. One of the big issues I'll talk about is they just didn't have the weaponry. I mean, there's some insurgencies afterwards and whatever, but, but pretty much I think everything was so burned out that people wanted to 
uh, be back. It was more of a homogeneous population than we have now, uh, but things are much different. So we can make some comparisons, but not a lot. We also can't prove exactly um, the, the levels of intensity at each, at each, each level with the available data. And the big problem is that with all the small arms floating around uh, during transmission, you certainly see it on TV and uh, small arms. And remember, uh, a 50 caliber machine gun is considered small arms. If it can be handled by three people, it's small arms. Uh, but AK-47s, you have to ask the International Committee of the Red Cross, who I've worked with a lot, um, and they really feel that that's the most dangerous um, ma weapon of mass destruction that's out there because they're all over the place, aren't they, okay? So in this post-conflict environment, as much as I don't like calling it that, there's a need to establish almost immediately a monopoly of force as the first priority to uh, resist the uh, return and within two days, <laughs> as you, your group wanted to talk about, uh, or within two months or two weeks, uh, because if the weapons are there, uh, they will be used. And, and I was commenting to the group earlier also that immediately at the end of the Yugoslav War, when the Accords were signed, the, the vulnerable populations moved into from women, children, elderly, and disabled to, to groups like widowed mothers now, uh, young adult males who are now all of a sudden can't do the dreams of their life and now are going to be the patriarchs of, the, uh, of their families. But Serbian soldiers who grew up in Bosnia, Croatia, now became actually refugees in Serbia uh, and, uh, and swore that if they didn't get jobs or their children couldn't go to school, which they weren't allowed to, uh, they were going to, they had their weapons and they were going to turn to war if, if things didn't get better. Uh, they had a piece on TV just uh, six months ago which just showed those, those, those camps are still there and the uh, Serbians now, still refugees in their country, are just as discontent as they were during that time. So the vulnerability is there. The thing is we want to call it something else. We can't call it war, so it's criminality we talk about, insurgents, we have lots of names for them but turns into banditry of some sort. And the confounding variables of the degree of this really fall back into the number of violent events, violent events that occur, uh, the levels of forces who actually have weapons who are still discontent or competing among themselves, and obviously the types of available weapons that, that, that are there, and, and you, you know exactly what they are, and, and they do tend to get used. The predictors of, of uh, returning to conflict um, is just plain stagnation, going no place. Um, certainly a, a recent, uh, that the country had a recent conflict, that's one of the most predictable ones, meaning that it was never really fixed and we jumped to some conclusions. Uh, but a worsening infant mortality rate, and I'm going to ask the group why, uh, because this is supposed to be health oriented, uh, why infant mortality rate? I mean, we have the under age five mortality rate that we use during war and just the crude mortality rate, how many people are dying or maternal mortality rate, but why do we use the infant mortality rate? Why, uh, why am I talking about that worsening? Why is it something that's very critical more so to this post-conflict environment than during war itself? Anybody at all? If, if you don't know, you should know, because the infant mortality rate has nothing to do with prenatal, antenatal, and postnatal care, which every mother in the developed world gets, okay, and we measure it on that. But it has more to do with just governance and ability to have education and training programs for mothers and fathers-to-be and, uh, and all, the, all the rest, and transportation and communication and everything. So it's, a, it's the only composite one that we have. It is one of the most sensitive indicators of really good governance that's speaking to a broad population. All right? And if we have disparate groups in the U.S. that are not getting the, uh, the great care, we look at the infant mortality rate and we look also that they're not getting those services. And with the financial crisis right now, Many of those services that do keep our infant mortality rate down are, are now disappearing. So we should see very sensitively a rise then in the infant mortality rate. 
If we look at um, Collier's work, you know, the bottom billion and others, but uh, dis uh, discouragingly, 47% of the countries return to conflict in, in, in 10 years. Um, and again, how is that being defined? What, so what's the impact of the health transition? I guess a, a question then is, if a country is at the end of the war, does health help get you there uh, to a better position? And the assumptions that we go on and the literature tends to support is that the best practices, and you were talking about lots of different best practices in law and transitional justice and all the rest, but health best practices that essentially will lead to improved health indices um, and field implementation of them will differ greatly from the emergency response. I mean, you all know what we do. We go during the emergency response and we try to maintain water, sanitation, uh, shelter, health, and food. That's what it's all based on. All the non-governmental organizations and the UN organizations are built in that way. And, and the whole premise of that, if we can provide that, we save lives. All right. What happens in the, is, is that when the conflict is over, the money dries up, the NGOs leave, and the most vulnerable time actually is the transition, which is already called post-conflict. So we actually have more indirect deaths from the fact that we no longer can provide those public health protections that you just find instinctively every day here, okay? The emergency response and the management requirements of the of that post-conflict time often pale compared to the challenges presented. Um, and the approach um, is more often something we're not really used to is, is often policy-based, not program-based. So during the emergency, the NGOs, International Rescue Committee, the ICRC, Mercy Corps, Oxfam, all the rest, Oxfam does water. Uh, you know, International Rescue Committee, I'm, I'm on the board and have been for for a couple of decades, we do the refugee camps, okay? But we're program-based, we go in. We don't, you know, there's no, not a big strategic plan. Our plan is to try to, try to mitigate those, those d direct deaths from, from the war, okay? But when you go move into the post-war arena, um, and you, if you don't have a strategic plan based on policy, you're just not gonna solve the problems. So it's a new environment that people aren't used to, and what we have a number of case studies that show that those that remain like to do just their own program stuff, and they're competing with a fledgling government that says, look, we'd like, we need to own this, and we need to get the money going in a certain direction because we have different priorities. So it, it, it's often months before uh, they get themselves trained in that regard. There's consummate failures can occur if indeed, and when I talked to the multidisciplinary group uh, the last two days, multi-sectoral programs and multidisciplinary pro programs and unprecedented coordination and collaboration are not embraced. Something we just don't do during the, during the emergency phase. And we like to claim that health has an independent impact because if people see that health is returning, uh, gee, maybe, maybe, maybe they won't return to fighting. Not just health, but the two things are health and education. Um, <clears throat> and, but health also has independent impact on political, economic, security objectives, and everything else that goes with it. And that health um, may be a pivotal element in determining really success or failure. Uh, the problem is, is that with all the monies put into the emergency phase with health to save lives, we get just a fraction of it uh, health-wise in the transition phase, yet that's when the death rates actually go up, and I'll talk to you about that. So we underestimate the level of the health effort that really is required. And we have real problems getting anybody, any of the donors interested in it, possibly because we also say, we enter the room saying, well, I want to talk to you about the post-conflict phase, and they, their eyes gloss over, gloss over right away that, oh, no, I just, I want to just save lives, okay? But uh, one of the things we know in every complex emergency you've seen in the last three decades has been different, but there's one similarity with each one of them, and that is that the health uh, resources, health facilities are the first to be destroyed and the last to be recovered. 
Other things recover before the health does. And if indeed they were provided initially by international NGOs, well, there's essentially nothing there. So we're talking about a resource base that's about 10% of what was prior to the conflict. And really, you must think more of just infrastructure because the system that was during the emergency phase is that they were the NGOs and the UN agencies. They came in, they were the system. Okay? Now you're going to have to depend on a fledgling Ministry of Health and whatever, so you have to talk about both infrastructure and system. And just think of East Timor, uh, which we don't think has been the most dramatic, but 70% of the health infrastructure was destroyed in every single town, village, along with the government building. So we're starting from scratch. So the question, uh, as I stated, if a country is at the end of the conflict, does health actually help you get there? And unfortunately, from our data, those uh, graphs, figures that you saw, in a large swath of, of countries, health alone does not seem to be the answer. Uh, and besides having it to be multidisciplinary and security probably first, um, if people really just want to fight, they will continue, and they will continue to do it. It's rather discouraging, unfortunately. But focus in a little bit more on health, and if you look at this, the blue line is actually the direct deaths that you get from either a large-scale natural disaster. So for, for Katrina, the hurricane came in, killed 991 people, right, from the direct results of that. Um, war, doo -doo -doo -doo, from weaponry. But you can see the red dotted line is actually the indirect deaths. Takes a while for the public health system to, with protection to, to fade away, but people begin to start dying from preventable diseases, okay, don't they? Uh, from waterborne diseases and <coughs> vaccine preventable ones and poor water, poor sanitation. But it is the highest even during the war, but it does not uh, get the attention. Um, the, uh, I was the interim minister of health in Iraq. Um, I didn't last long. I disagree with Rumsfeld. Uh, but um, I told him he had a public health emergency um, immediately. Actually, the ICRC colleagues, mission uh, uh, head there, he said, I asked him just last summer, how did you know he had a public health emergency there in Baghdad? And he said, within two days. But it was actually totally denied. And, and part of the thing when I said, well, who's going to take care of this? We don't need to. We're an occupying force. We don't have to undo it because we're not recognizing the Geneva Conventions. And the UN and the NGOs can do it. Well, of course, they didn't. And if you've been reading the uh, Inspector General reports, it still hasn't been done. Still hasn't been done eight years afterwards. So the indirect deaths, which really haven't been, haven't been uh, um, uh, tabulated very well. But the, own, the first report that came out, which was October of 2004, so a year and a half after the start of the war, the, the first Iraqi Minister of Health came in, who started a surveillance uh, system for the first time, said that there were more people dying from public health consequences than violence, but obviously not getting the attention. There's a decay function that extends over about a decade after the war. And if we just look at Central Africa, during the conflict period, the indirect deaths were 71% of it. It's up to 90% in some places. Once the shooting has stopped for the six months transition period, it becomes 83% or above. This is just 83% in Central Africa. And drops to about 45% uh, in four years and doesn't get back to the baseline for about 10 years. Primarily women and children, mental health issues but it's also the Serbian soldiers. You know, Croatia came out pretty well, didn't they, in, in that former Yugoslavia war. But uh, in a very few months after that war was over, there were 800 suicides among the Croatian soldiers. Why? Why? Okay. Uh, we don't have sensitivities to what we do to either measure that or to be attentive to, to those things. And that's just one of the new vulnerable populations that come up. So just some of them are suicides, depression, alcohol, drug rates go up, out-of-work males, uh, the IDPs and camps, whether it's Croatia, Afghanistan, and Katrina. We published a study a year after Katrina uh, that showed that there was a 47% increase in excess deaths, mortality, in New Orleans a year after the, uh, the, uh, the hurricane. Um, uh, how did we find that out? 
Well, it was from the citizens in New Orleans who were very concerned that they were reading about more obituaries in the Times-Picayune. Remember the paper that remained during the hurricane and the aftermath? But the public health department in New Orleans was a shambles. It never had a good surveillance system. It was still old. It wasn't electronic. It was just writing on paper. Well, all that paper got wet and turned into pulp, so they had no surveillance system. The three people who made up the physicians in the public health system that were uh, supposed to take care of this, one committed suicide, one died of a heart attack during the event itself, and there was one left, and he had no surveillance system, so he didn't know. It's the citizens who said, something's wrong here. So we, when we used the obituaries at a database, we found out it was a 47% increase in mortality. So already within a year, more people were dying than, than the direct effects of the hurricane itself. Same thing in war. We use gender-based violence as really that intimate partner rate as a marker of community breakdown. It's just one of many, but it's one of the most sensitive ones that tells us a sentinel situation that there's some economic and physical uh, insecurity going on, whether it's in the, uh, the uh, former Zaire, the DRC, Congo, Iraq, Katrina, all the same. And also, typically, because in bringing health systems back, it's interesting, in countries that never had any user pay, it's almost uh, demand now that there's a user pay system as part of bringing back the health system. Well, this is in populations that don't have it. But they say, well, you know, the economic thing, the World Bank says, if you improve the economy, everything else will follow. Well, that's not always the case. And so uh, if a family has to make a choice of who goes back to school, they'll send the boy back. But what we found is that the girls who don't go back, they stay at home, they work in the fields, but they have a higher mortality rate. All right? Some health education is happening, some surveillance is happening when they go to school, but they don't. So all of these things are very sensitive, the new vulnerable population of the post-conflict situation. Strongest elements of success or failure, which is just the reluctance to return to fighting, and we'd like to think that, is again, as I said, conflict mitigation, so existing forces required to suppress the conflict. Education and health delivery, so the first things should, should be for, for, uh, showcased is to show that, gee, yeah, people can get education, they can get health, contributing to quality of life, but it's still taking the, ch the chances here, but also that they would provide some job creation, income generation. Those are the first three we'd like to see. But it's obviously it's more complex than that because it still can fall apart, especially if people want to return to fighting. This, the health as an entry point to this is relevant when there is our major health problems that exist right after the war is over with. High maternal and child mortality rates, high AIDS and malaria that's very prevalent. But remember, we have these thresholds that we can that we describe, uh, people in the countries know when war is there, but when we say there's a major disaster, a major war uh, above that threshold. But if those mortality rates do not come down from the emergency phase level uh, and the existing public health structure is inadequate to deal with it, if it remains high, we better go in there pretty darn fast, uh, which, again we, again, we don't often have the resources. So what is the, what's the rice mix? Well. Other than health, uh, requires a mix of military, social, welfare, health, all the things that you all were talking about the last two days to recover. But this varies considerably across all post-conflict uh, countries. Uh, the uniqueness to every country is high. Um, there's lots of room for interpretation. But it's like the complex emergencies. I mean, I uh, heard diplomats and others who, you know, they were just involved in Somalia. So every complex emergency after that was like Somalia, okay? Every post-conflict situation, you argue, well, I was in Guadalupe. I was in here, and this is the way it is. No, it's entirely different. They are totally unique. But we struggle with trying to bring some sanity to that. Focus less on reconstruction, more on correcting the underlying problems that caused the instability. And people often argue top-down, bottom-up kind of approach, but it's really we don't, can't give up the emergency short-term kinds of things. We really have to combine them along with the long-term development. And that takes unique kind of collaboration and cooperation to do that. Recovery coming to the end uh, is country-specific. Uh, the post-conflict phase, as I alluded to, may be a myth. And as I said, I call it uh, environment short of war. 
that's not very good. You can't use that in a cocktail party, can you, very well, but uh, uh, to explain it. But, and health can be an entry point, especially when the major health problems exist, but it also may restore legitimacy to the fledgling governments. They were pretty good at fighting the war, but are they good at providing this? Because unfortunately, uh, they, those commanders become the president sometimes, so they have absolutely no idea how to govern. But if they can bring back health and education, then maybe there's a start. Have to restore the essential services, so that's not any different than the emergency phase. But look for that common thread, and you spoke about the common thread these last two days. Obviously, this is an old slide, but uh, uh, the common thread in both biologic and cultural aspects of primary health care. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the things that's universal about health is that if any of you had appendicitis, or if you had appendicitis in the most rural part of Africa or Asia, um, health people the world over know how to diagnose it. It's quite universal and uniform. Okay. And we also know that we have to take it out in a certain way to save a life. Uh, but that goes for anything with health. The problem is, is that uh, the biologic side is universal, but the cultural side may be different. And I use the example of, oh, gee, we don't get any, any advancement in health in, in the post-conflict phase unless we bring back nurses who primarily do primary health care in most of the countries. But in Baghdad, nursing is a dirty word. Uh, nurses in the first Persian Gulf War um, were all expats, Pakistan, Philippines. They left. International Organization Migration were there to take them out before the hostilities, the bombing started. They didn't come back. So Saddam said, I mean, they were supervisorial nurses, which are different, but they don't see patients there. And so Saddam said, okay, we're such a great country, we don't need nurses. Okay, the families can take care of the patients in the hospitals. And then when that failed, he offered nursing jobs to petty criminals in the jails and said, you can either work in the hospitals or remain in jail for your sentences. Well, they, of course, they went to the hospitals. But they account for most of the rapes and the crime within the hospitals. And they still do. And it's a, you don't talk about nursing in, in, in Iraq. Okay? It's not. It's a dirty word. You go to Liberia, and during Taylor's time and the height of the war there, nurses were still being graduated. They couldn't have enough spots for all the ones that were, that were qualified. They kept primary care and health care going in Liberia. They were highly respected. They're still highly respected. They graduated about 300 a year compared to, during the war, five doctors. And so if you go there to get some care and diagnosis, you're going to see a nurse. Baghdad, you know, you can't, well, outside of Baghdad, primary health care, at least there's no doctors who want to do primary health care, and there's no nurses there. But if you go to the clinics in Liberia, and so they're maintaining some health equity and quality because there are nurses. So, you know, the biology is there, but the culture is different. And that has to do with every aspect of health. It really does, okay? So look for that common thread. Conflicts arising from highly complex political emergencies, so lots of different players, okay? The more complicated it is and, and whether a legitimate government can take control is the big thing. But be, be aware, and this is my last point, be aware of the asymmetrical conflicts. That's the Afghanistan and the uh, Iraq, and they are different. Um, there's three components to asymmetrical warfare. One is the asymmetrical warfare itself, uh, uh, but the other is pervasive insecurity. Uh, everybody's insecure, okay? And yet, our security plans that the coalition brought in were for the military. Uh, it didn't do well with the UN, did it? Didn't do well with the ICRC, didn't do well with the civilians. There has to be a security plan for everybody, and there isn't. And the third component is that the asymmetrical warfare produces a prolonged public health emergency. So think of it today. The water, sanitation, food, shelter, and everything, those indices are worse off than uh, when Sodom was, was in power. That's what they cause, all right? And the military was not, really did not have any strategic plan. They threw stuff against it, but it's not bought back. So the indirect deaths will continue to rise in those places. Environmental degradation, 
we don't know how to deal with the Hades of the world, okay? Same island as the Dominican Republic, they have trees. Haiti has no trees. It's down to 2% of the, of the total forestation. So when the hurricane comes through, hits Florida, 10, 15, 12, 15 people die from the direct effects. Same direct effects kill those people in Haiti. But after that, anywhere between three and five, 6,000 people die from the mudslides because there's no root structure. There's the flooding and the mudslides and everything else like that. We don't know whether it's a developmental emergency, an emergency emergency, it's in a category all of itself. So where do you start in a Haiti? It's totally different, okay? And the healthcare worker crisis, because we have no, we have 57 countries now that have no healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and also they have no surgeons. If you graduate as a, rarely as a surgeon in Africa, um, it's expected that you go to Iowa and become a surgeon there and send money back, okay? But if you have an appendicitis in Africa right now, in the majority of countries, you will be operated by a non-doctor who has some technical skills to be able to crack open the belly and take it out, pretty simple. But if you have a complication, it's not going to be. So quality of care quality of life is just not going to be bought back. So health care worker crisis, which we didn't have before, uh, but they were driven out by war and other things. So those are the complications that you have to bring into the health side things in, in making the decisions. So thank you very much. I've said enough, and uh, hope some of that was interesting to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Skip. Um, Dan, we're going to ask you to lead off the conversation with some reactions. And that was a fascinating talk, and I think we, we, we all have a lot to assimilate here in terms of the, uh, particularly with regard to the, sorry, with regard to the, um, the indices that you raise, gender-based violence, et cetera. The only points I'd like to make very briefly are, uh, are, are, are these, that the one of the interesting, more broadly speaking, one of the more, one of the interesting correlations between uh, uh, cities and um, and uh, and the conditions that we're we're describing today uh, are historical, uh, and, uh, and and we've discussed this in the course of our meetings in the last two days. Part of the un un really sort of unprecedented growth in hyper urbanization that is taking place on the planet today, and, part, and, and in particular of, of what we call pirate urbanization, um, informal growth of cities, uh, is in fact an outcome of war. Uh, in conjunction later with structural adjustment policies that were, uh, th that exacerbated an already developing uh, what, what one scholar has referred to as a growing you know, a planet of slums. Um, we live today in, and here two good examples are that we discussed in the meeting are uh, that the um, partition that took place between India and Pakistan in uh, 47 resulted in the creation of mega slums in, in both polities, uh, which then took off from there. Forced urbanization policies conducted by the United States in Vietnam did the same. And so we see that the process of violent decolonization has had a uh, significant, uh, uh, the, the, the violent consequences of decolonization have historically had a correlate in the emergence of new, uh, largely informal uh, growth in megacities that were then at some level ratified and exacerbated by structural adjustment policies that called upon governments to privatize uh, uh, housing markets and to capitalize their assets in other ways. The consequence, uh, and now let me talk about the other correlation, the consequence in the present is at some level cognitive. Uh, one of the consequences is, are, 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 is cognitive in the sense that we now live in a world where um, in the United States, here in the United States, roughly, roughly, on average, and in the, developing, in the developed world as a whole, 6% of urbanism is presumed to be pirate urbanism in the sense of squatting or people actually uh, getting rent from from uh, informal housing. Um, yet in the 
majority of, uh, of uh, where the population, where, where the growth is largest in the uh, formerly colonized world, the figure is 78% on average. 78%, the majority of urban growth today is taking place in the peripheries of uh, what used to be called cities, uh, like Mexico City, uh, where essentially there is no effective governance to speak of, uh, where there is no real semblance of infrastructure or, infra or administration that governs that, that form of development. And as a result, new forms of political association are taking place there. And that's quite an important factor. If you'd like to know the most extreme case, they happen to be in cities in Ethiopia, where 94% of all growth has nothing to do with the formal economy or uh, with governance. Um, the last point I would make then is why, why is this represent an interesting uh, and important object of scrutiny for us in the academy? It's because a lot of scholars, particularly in the fields of political science, international relations, and other fields, envir environmental security, recognize that these really represent significant challenges to the way that we understand things like states, things like governance, um, and, uh, and power. We, we now have the majority of the world's population living in cities, and the majority of those people who are living in cities essentially no longer being stakeholders in what you used to call civil society. And this represents national security challenges for the states in which those cities have developed, and it represents really significant challenges to understanding how uh, the populations of those cities, or what we used to call cities, actually um, uh, themselves contest uh, uh, or, or make bids for hegemony, all of which, of course, have significant public health uh, uh, repercussions. The last point here that I'd like to make concerning uh, uh, any viable distinction between environmental security, public health, and the post-conflict environment pertains to the challenges that are coming from factors that we wouldn't normally consider to be either war or uh, or, or acts of God, and these have to do with ecological, eco impending, likely, possible ecological catastrophes that are at some level a, fi a function of mega urbanization itself. And, and the potential, for example, of, uh, of, of illnesses that uh, simply are exas that n don't simply generate are not, are not simply emerging uh, sui generis as a result of natural factors, but uh, at some level uh, really uh, opportunistically <coughs> develop out of the uh, conditions that are now being created themselves are important factors. Avian flu is the big fear, but there are many others as well. Thank you. Okay. We have about a half hour. I'm going to open it up for questions, and I'm going to begin with a Question submitted by my colleague, uh, Jeff DeBelko. Um, what is the hardest piece of the immediate post-conflict environment for those of us studying it to understand or appreciate, and how do we better integrate this reality into more detached analysis? Nice small question. No, I, I think in part I, I answer that, and that is that we better, we better start calling it something else, and we better start learning to define it but it's just a lower, lower level of intensity. Um, the most vulnerable and the most uh, uh, difficult and the, the riskiest time is the immediate transition that may last for a long period of time. Um, and we never even have a prayer to look at sustainability unless you can overcome that. So, um, you know, we, in, in getting to the city thing, which I feel is, going to be our next major humanitarian uh, crisis, but it's still in this post-conflict uh, environment. We just don't know who these people are. And we have absolutely no idea in these mega cities, among the disaffected, the million that come in every six months and all the rest of the stuff, but those that have already no, uh, no um, access to, uh, uh, to public health protections. We don't know who they are. Uh, you know, it's suggested that in Lagos and in Africa, and, and Dan alluded to that, yeah, uh, you know, we now have 67% of, of the population in Africa 
uh, live in, in urban settings. I mean, we all still have this mindset that Africa is, is a rural area and, and all the rest, but you can go to rural areas and you just see ghosts of farmer, uh, former villages, which is really, really sad because it has, it's the one continent that has the most resources, and those resources are not in the cities. But it's said that the majority of the new people moving in to uh, Lagos, for example, and other cities in Africa, is a widowed or single woman with, young woman with uh, two to five children going there for social services, but l uh, leaving the rural area because it was just not secure, and majority of them already had been raped at least once. So, but we really don't know who they are. We don't know how many children, <laughs> we don't know how many, no. And, and, you know, if this was a war kind of thing, you would expect us to go in, I've been part of those emergency teams, to go in and do the assessment, okay? And that's important. I mean, even in the, in the Kurdish refugee cri crisis of those hills, you know, and we just expected well, it was a normal population. No, it turned out to be 50% children under the age of, of five, most under the age of one, 30% women, young women, and 20% elderly males. You know, all the males, the other males were off fighting or already killed. It changed what we had to do, all right? And these were people who never went camping in the hills of northern Iraq. They were from, they were teachers and accountants and, and, uh, and other people that, uh, you know, uh, from Duhok and Salamania and Mosul and all those places. So you need to know the animal. We need to know the data from those cities before we can even begin to start doing the secondary kinds of discussions about this. So anyways, bro too broad of an answer for, for Jeff, but, but, but about it. Yeah. Okay, oh, do you want to add anything? I, I guess I, I can't even begin to answer that question, but I, uh, I, I, would, I, would, I, I would redirect it in, 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 the, in a very simple way, which is that um, um, I think the fir the first step would be in recognizing that we we tend to conflate the term conflict with w with uh, with something else war and uh the good news is that really there are no longer any wars taking place in the world it seems to be an ex an extinct animal but we seem to continue to think about conflict in the sense that we think about wars and for that reason misunderstand the animal that we're reviewing so like skip I I believe that, I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious, of course wars take place, but they take place in the form of something that does not resolve itself in the way that we used to understand with cessations of hostilities, a formal truce, peace, an occupation that's benign, you know, it, the, 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 the Japan-German uh, uh, examples. In point of fact, um, there have been a number of misnomers for, for, or inadequate terms for what we now call war, one of the terms that's been discussed a lot is new wars, and for very good reasons. So new wars, the term new war describes a situation that's more, more, more like what we're encountering. The first is that the principal targets of hostilities and conflict today are civilians and not militaries. And that's not just about, that's not just about uh, asymmetrical conflict, um, because the largest killer of civilians in violent conflict in the world today is their own governments. Um, it also speaks about ratios, mortality ratios, the term new wars, because the, uh, whereas in World War I, the number of civilians to military killed, the ratio was one to eight. Today, it's be about pretty much presumed to be the, op the inverse. Uh, eight civilians are killed for every, one, for every one soldier to the degree that soldiers participate. And um, lastly, the distinction between peace and war uh, is also largely extinct. What we encounter are conditions in which there is uh, uh, the, 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 the development of something we don't yet know how to name, which is neither peace nor war. Okay, I already have three people on the floor. This gentleman will be first. We'll come over here and move here. We have a microphone for you right now. Could you talk about the return on investment of health investments versus education investments? You put them together. Yeah, I, I think they have to go uh, hand in hand. I wish I had, I wish we did have some data about the return investment, but they seem to have to go hand in hand because it's something that people uh, see as uh, essential to the return of quality of life. Um, and um, you're not going to have good health unless you start having education about health, among other things, uh, and vice versa. But um, 
And so I'd say the return investment with both of those things is quite, quite high. But I can't give you any figures, but they have to go hand in hand. We're not, uh, and I, I would say that probably some of my colleagues will just talk about health, but I, I would caution you just don't, the health people have to talk about education, and the education people have to talk about health, and vice versa. And at the same time, that hopefully both of those things will generate some job creation locally. And if they start seeing that, uh, maybe there'll be more, you know. So, a good question. Don't know. Okay, we have a question right there. Uh, the woman right behind you, right there. Right here. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Debbie Sapir. I came all the way here from Brussels to hear Skip speak. Now, um, it was a very, very um, broad-based presentation that you gave, and I heard a lot of things that I haven't heard you say before. Uh, but you did mention, you gave a statistic there which spoke about, I think, 47% of the conflicts that return, go back again to conflicts after 10 years. And I, I think Paul Collier has been looking into that as that's well. That's his quote, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, if that's the case, would you be able to say something about how you see these indicators or these inter interventions that you mentioned, how would they operate in what would be a pre-conflict situation. So if conflicts relapse into conflict after post-conflict, you have a period in which you can do something for prevention of conflicts. And, I'm, and even if the country is not in conflict, I'm thinking of countries like Haiti, you mentioned Haiti, like Zimbabwe, for example, uh, Myanmar, these are all countries on the slippery slope. They have not yet seen a conflict, but they probably will, Zimbabwe in a matter of months. Now, would you say that the kind of interventions you said and the kind of policy you said about stabilizing the, the, the social situation, would they also operate as effectively in a pre-conflict state? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that the pre-conflict stage is one that's been called um, you know, political kind of violence. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when Albania happened, um, the State Department with all their databases, everything said, God, how did that happen? You know, and we, we couldn't predict this. And, um, uh, and retrospectively, we went back to say, gee, what were the most sensitive indices um, of the pre-conflict time? Uh, that would have told us that something was was falling apart. So we had to go retrospectively back. And remember, the the political violence was slow and not necessarily um, understood or uh, by outside people uh, over a number of months, if not more, okay? But during that time, as the people were feeling more and more the the, the political unrest, that was then going to go over that threshold to war. Um, uh, access, so it's the two A's. We always talk about access and availability to health. Okay? And people's access and what was available to them began to narrow and narrow down. So Albania had pretty good health care, and you, know, you could have access to, a, to a, uh, a physician or a hospital at any time. And I always talk about... You know, I think everybody in this this audience uh, either had a has a child or, or remember a, a sibling, and you know they always wait. I'm a pediatrician also, so I can tell you this: they they wake up in the middle of the night with an ear infection. Well, in most developed countries, you can, gee, if you really want to, you could get in the car and go to some emergency department. But you can have access 24 hours a day. What happened in Albania is that was available, but. As political violence and unrest, even though there wasn't anything confirmed either as, uh, you know, a, a, a time where you, uh, you couldn't go out, um, people began to just be more and more um, uh, sensitive and aware and, and, and whatever. So uh, near the end, the actual access for health care for some kind of emergency was about two hours during the early afternoon. And they'd have to come back before, you know, the, the curfew was there. And, and ambulances wouldn't go out and whatever, okay? And during that time, but only retrospectively, the most sensitive indicators were that the infant mortality rate started to go up, 
uh, the maternal mortality rate started to go up, the underage five mortality rate go up. They were the most sensitive indicators of pre-conflict decline in access and availability, okay? More so than the economic indicators and everything else like that, okay? I don't, I don't think we have a system that can actually tap that into some of these countries we're talking about. But, you know, the International Rescue, uh, International Crisis Group comes out every month, as you know, and gives us the countries that are, have political violence, which ones are improving, which ones are deteriorating. Now, despite the fact that we have less declared wars, those numbers, which are usually high 60s, low 80s, has not changed when we had the declared wars. So they're telling us something, that we still have these countries of a level of political violence, conflict, low intensity conflict. We're all saying the same damn thing, okay? But what sh we should be measuring is just access and availability to, to health care. Because every, every sector of, of society is going to use that as the most sensitive indicator. And in this sense, had that been available, we could have said, look, Albania is about ready to fold, okay? So uh, Mother Nature's in charge, and the, those, those indices, which are usually ta uh, tallied every month, can tell us something that otherwise I don't know of another sensitive indicator to do it. Does that make sense to you, Debbie? Thank you. you want to add anything? Okay. Uh, this gentleman right here, and then we'll come over to this side. Yes, thank you very much. I'm uh, Jed Schilling. It was a very interesting talk. I've done most of my work in development, and seeing this broader view is very important. Um, I've got a couple of questions. The first, in one of your earlier remarks, you indicated that the lack of restoration of health care and education was an indication of a general government shortfall. And so if you look at the countries that return back into conflict, is that due to the fact that people are very dissatisfied about the health and education services of the government or that the government overall has failed to establish a stable system which gives rise to various opposition groups who want to establish their power and just take over. So it's more of an indicator than the real uh, driver. And the second question, given what you said about as an indicator, um, given that Cuba has very high quality health care, roughly the same as the United States, is that one of the reasons there's been no uh, internal opposition or violence to the government because they've been getting that quality care? Two very good questions. And, and the first one, uh, the, uh, the, second, the second part of that is, is the dominant one, okay? The government just doesn't have it together yet to do it. But the other element that's in there, if we don't see it happening, is the fact that when they do restore, the fledgling government that's come in, especially in the complicated political emergencies that occur, uh, that the tendency is to give health and education to those groups that supported them. So there, there's still, it just not, it's just not equity there, just not equity there. So it's a combination of those two. Um, but I, I remember having to, I was, I was involved in both the uh, immediate post-conflict situation, former Yugoslavia, but also Liberia. But the people that I had to talk to in Liberia were the, uh, the local commanders, okay? I mean, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll always remember distinctly the back and forth I had with this guy. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe he was a good commander, although, you know, the, they tended to, you know, the rebel groups came in, shot up the civilians, they left, took a lot of loot, and then the government would come in, shoot the remaining civilians, and take the rest of the loot. So they never really clashed themselves, okay? So I'm not sure how, much, how good warlords they were. But there was absolute, I actually asked him what his background was, and I, and I said to him, do you realize now that you, you're responsible for bringing this government back in, you know, to power? And, uh, you know, he quite honestly admitted that he never even thought of that, and he certainly wasn't qualified. So who they're going to let to come in, who's available to, to do that, takes a long period of time. The second question was um, Cuba. Cuba. Yeah, well, uh, the health industry, of course, they, they, the competition has been with Cuba and the United States, who has the lower, lower infant mortality rate, knowing that that has a composite and tells a lot about the government. But you have to be aware, too, that the Cubans do not um, tally infants uh, uh, who died 
uh, before two days after birth, which is we do and other countries do. So that kicks it up. Plus the fact that we have such a health care system that we have prenatal care for the, the kid that's born weighing one pound, okay? That's a higher mortality rate. So, you know, it's, you have to bring in those factors. But yes, they, the Cuban government obviously has so many doctors that they, that's their biggest ex export. I mean, it is. They, they will provide physicians for Brazil in exchange for oil. I mean, that's the, the economy with that. Um, but they saturate, absolutely saturate, with primary health care. Right? Um, the access problem there in Cuba is the fact that um, if indeed you have a, a heart attack or something else like that, that person has to be transported a fair distance and, and those services may or may not be available to them for some kind of more specialized care. So, uh, you know, there's certainly people from Spain and Europe and other places like that who go to, to, uh, to uh, Cuba to get uh, their, their bypass operations, and they're technically quite good. But if you're a Cuban, and it is a class society, if you're in the high class, you'll get that same kind of surgery, but the majority of Cubans will not get that kind of surgery available to them. So um, it's a political competition, which we wish wasn't there, uh, but you have, to, you have to drill down and, and look at exactly what's being measured. But yes, if you throw a lot of doctors against something and availability and lots of primary care, everything's primary care, but that's not necessarily specialization. And so we have some higher rates if you look at those from heart attacks. But of course, you're going to lower it, and depending again on how you're going to measure it. But it's, okay. that makes sense to you? Yeah. Right here. Um, yes, I, I would just wanted to go back to the idea that um, uh, the healthcare system says something about that the conflict not really has ended. And it's something we, when I was with the Red Cross in, in, in the Balkans, we observed. In 2000, in Serbia, the cardiovascular uh, diseases had gone up um, hugely uh, just in the immediate afterward of the of the bombing in 1999, and infant mortality has risen also extremely. So, um, but the interesting effect in in southeastern Europe, I think, is that it is um, there's a it, there's a correlation between those numbers going up after the immediate war takes place. But there's also a constant rise since the end of the 1980s, so since transition had started, which is um, parallel to the same rise in other Eastern European countries which not have seen violent conflict. So um, Poland and Czechoslovakia and everything further east. And the UNDP had a report in 1999, um, 10 years of transition, where they said that life expectancy has declined 10 years in Eastern and Central Europe in the 1990s, and then detailing also the... So um, it is also, I think, all these effects have to be also seen in a global restructuring of health systems. And um, why does has it decline in Central Eastern Europe? Of course, because of the liberalization and the, and the running down of the health system, but also the reform of the health system. So going away from the polyclinical uh, approach of the Soviet Union to the specialized surgeon approach, which brought a whole change in the education system. So Albania, uh, one important reason that um, the Red Cross said was a reason for, for uh, growing health problems. It was a very healthy population under the communists. I mean, the, the life expectancy was extremely high. Um, but the change from the polyclinical system to the, to the specialized uh, system of Western Europe brought huge disruptions in the, in the health system. So there's also this global engineering of health that... Yeah, and, and I've got to add to that. You're absolutely right. It's, remember, I talked about on the slide, you have to look at the infrastructure and the systems, okay? The systems really began to fold in both the so, uh, former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe uh, uh, several years before. But, and, and the whole issue with the medications for TB is extremely important. 
uh, you know, there's a it's a it's a universal requirement for treating TB now with about five or six medications. While as their economies let down, they turn to just a couple of drugs. All right, and prisoners went to to jail where they were exposed to people who had TB. They got it. They were treated just a couple. All of our TB resistant forms. Uh, a, a TB, right? Medication resistant forms of TB throughout the entire world can be related back to the failing economy in the former Soviet Union when they started to not treat them adequately. But the other thing is that those countries were obtaining a lot of the medications from outside. They were expensive. So the cardiovascular things, more people were showing up with strokes, so they weren't being treated for their high blood pressure. Diabetics were coming into having diabetic shock. They weren't getting their insulin. We saw this in Yugoslavia. We saw this in, in Iraq. Iraq and Yugoslavia, we consider developed countries, okay? In the first year, because all the medications stopped in, in Baghdad, we have absolutely no idea what happened to these people. We, we think that they just plain died. But the first year, there were no death certificates. But uh, they, had, they had very sophisticated cardiac units, dialysis units. All of that stopped. So what happened to those older people? They just died. Okay, clearly they did. Same thing in former Yugoslavia. But the economies who have to bring in medications, so you'll see that among that group. But with that too, in the, in the failure of the systems, you're going to start seeing not only increase in chronic disease deaths, infant mortality rate will go up because, again, you need a system to take care of the, the newborns, all right, <laughs> that thing. So it is, but, but in the developing world, we're in Africa where the uh, uh, average age uh, 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 living is about 39. They don't live long enough to have the chronic disease, so we don't see that there. In the developed country, we start seeing the chronic disease mortality and morbidity going up. You're absolutely right. It, it's much more related, however, to system failure first. And, uh, and I think that's the same thing that we were talking about in, in Albania. The system was that they weren't having the access to the system. It still comes back to system and infrastructure put together, and I think your observations are right on. Thank you. Okay. We're, we're, we're down to about 10 minutes. I have a question here, and we'll have a question there. We'll have two questions on this side, and then we'll wrap up. But first, right here, Salama. Um, I guess my question was about, I mean, you, you were talking about access and um, looking at how um, health care can become an indicator of, of sort of, you know, recovery from post-conflict situation and so on. But I think a lot of uh, the concerns that, that humanitarian organizations also have is, is just how much service do you provide to people who are displaced because of conflict, especially when they are living right next to local populations who may not have that kind of access. And that leads to very specific kinds of conflict as well, that you might have a group of people who have especially in humanitarian intervention, that you have, you know, medical teams, so on and so forth, who come in and cater to people because of their very specific situation leading to antagonisms with, with local populations, leading precisely to these conflict issues. And I think that works even in, in, in if you're talking about urban environments, it, it becomes a question of legitimacy. Um, that access to healthcare also becomes a, who are these migrants, as you were saying, coming in and what right do they have to access health care systems that a taxpayer, for example, the argument often goes, is paying for, that, you know, they are sort of taking advantage of a situation which some will argue is, is being subsidized for them, which again leads to certain kinds of conflicts. So I'm just wondering if you can speak yeah. to that. You know, we recognized this 30 years ago when we saw more refugees than we do now. And so the, remember, people who cross a border, refugees, if they remain in the host country, even though they're being pursued by the government to be killed by them, they're internally displaced. But when we set up refugee camps, the lowest mortality rates were always in the refugee camps than su the surrounding population. And again, not much attention was put to that because we thought these things would be over with quickly. But the longer they stayed, and obviously required under international law to do this, UNHCR, uh, 
it, then the programs had to expand outside, okay? So we're always going to get this. We just don't have the resources to continue to do this. And, uh, you know, we will not see a change of that until health education and health care worker numbers and everything increase because we just don't have – the, the the programs the NGOs are program related so they don't necessarily have the mandate or the ability or the capacity to go outside that and we we do tend to cause uh, more conflict because of it and uh, we try to get equity uh, certainly the NGOs come back and say you know I've got to go outside my my program because it's causing more tensions uh, the the successful programs are the ones who then train more people within the program that are indigenous so that they can go out and do that. Those are the good programs. The programs that failed in Liberia were the ones who did not, who bought in expatriate nurses, and then when they left, they went with their nurses. But if they trained nurses, then they were able to continue to, and do that. So you're, you're at, right. It's, but it is a problem we've caused because of that. Final two questions. We'll take them together. This gentleman and then the woman. Yes. I, I was listening uh, to your presentation from a very provincial point of view. I'm an economist, a behavioral economist, yeah. but an economist nonetheless. And uh, I was trying to think, suppose I am the economic advisor on health policy in a country which is in a uh, post-crisis situation. What am I getting from what you've just presented? I'm, I'm being overwhelmed with this is a serious problem, that's a serious problem, the other is a serious problem. Wait, we have to find out who these people are. Uh, you don't mean really that we have to stop everything else and find out who these people are. We should be doing that at the same time. Exactly. Well, but what I was, what I was really thinking is, uh, are you gathering messages? Uh, I know that they would vary from culture to culture, society to society, but are you gathering messages on uh, what's relatively most important to do, second most important to do, third most important to do, et cetera? Or are you overwhelming people with... Uh, there are 17 problems which you've got to uh, attend, and I really can't give you much help on which to attend to first. Uh, that's my general question. Uh, I would just make one suggestion, incidentally. Um, one of the most insightful uh, articles that I've read on uh, uh, health economics, behavioral health economics, is by someone who's at Harvard Medical School, uh, uh, Richard Frank, who you may or may not know. And I can't help but wonder whether there might not be some interesting collaboration here. Okay. Before you answer, let's get the last question on the floor. Yeah, Jane Pratt. I'm an, I'm an environmentalist, and my question is similar to the last two. It has to do with overwhelming conditions. If we look at some simple indicator like glacial melt, we're getting increases in water availability in the short term and surely we'll have a dearth of water in the fairly near to medium term, mm -hmm. which will drive migration for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's happening in the Hindu Kush Himalaya, it's happening in Africa, it's happening in the entire Andean chain. What may well happen, and may well happen within the next 20 to 30 years, is a mass migration. And what I was struck with was your comment that we're not equipped. We don't have the systems, we don't have the infrastructure to deal with this post-conflict situation now. What, what are the three or four most important things we ought to be thinking about in terms of preparing for catastrophic change. Okay. The, the, the first part, you're absolutely right. Um, and unfor unfortunately, we have to give people the uncomfortable but real information. But the three things, yes, provide enough security so they won't return to, to fighting. And that can be either internal or external. Provide the health education issues so that they can see some improvement of quality of life. And then st start job creation so they can begin to start taking over. I mean, unfortunately, those are the three steps. Uh, are there other issues, the economy, whatever, that still, it all comes together. Um, <clears throat> but the, um, uh, we, the World Bank would say, 
if we just improve the economy, everything else will follow, okay? And that has been the mantra for a while, all right? The problem is, is that they did this without some attention to the public health, all right? So now we are sort of faced with it, us, about trying to, because they're now becoming the real risk population. But as Freud says, there's 10% of truth in what people say. So the part with the economy is that if, if we do those things that I listed, and did not improve the economy, we're, we're just treading water with that population, all right? So uh, it, uh, uh, the answers are multifactorial, multi-sectoral. And, uh, but um, what I think we're trying to speak about here is why these countries return and, um, and that there is still a level of conflict going on and somebody's got to provide some security so there's some semblance of return. Uh, there's also a great deal of need to help to train fledgling governments to govern. Uh, when Kosovo uh, happened, the first request of the Kosovars was teach us how to manage things. For all our time under the Serbs, we never had any supervisor or position. They came to the states to get training. We sent the people there. That was a big investment. And so, yes, that's a big issue, too, is train people so they can manage and they can deal with the economy and can deal with these other things. Uh, so that's the best I can answer. But un unfortunately, I've got to tell you the uncomfortable real information. As far as your question goes, um, uh, yes, <laughs> that's another talk. But I will tell you that you know, we're certainly seeing like Lake Victoria has decreased all, already uh, uh, 10 feet and increased about 6 degrees. Uh, tropical diseases are moving north. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, we've had a lot of things, uh, but we've been, it's all been quite suppressed or repressed. Uh, we've been looking desperately for a, a sentinel proxy that we can convince the naysayers that there is something going on. But in Polynesia, where there is obviously climate change, in some elevation of, of the water. Um, uh, you know, so, so maybe some islands have disappeared and you've seen that. But the real physics of the rise in the water is that it first un encroaches underneath the islands. And so in Polynesia, uh, it has um, uh, disrupted the taro and the coconut palms. So we're seeing for the first time in Polynesia starvation that we never saw before. So starvation as a sentinel thing. Those people will migrate. We know they will. Um, so either we all move north and people come in, but it does come down. The reality is we have too many people on the face of the earth. Uh, it's, uh, and it's just not, you know, it's population in some situations, but it's mostly densities of populations that disrupts the public health. Um, I don't think that we've had the time to really think about it or put the resources against it. And unfortunately, the political system, not just here, but in most countries, is to deny that because everybody's afraid of what it will do with the, with the population panicking them. But I think we certainly do need to start putting resources. We, I'm not sure whether some of these things are answerable, but I'm sure some of them are. Some of them are doable. But yes, we have to start doing that. But we're seeing all those sentinel things tropical diseases moving north as they would, uh, and the starvation and a whole bunch of other things. But if we keep denying it, we're not going to get put resources against it. But that's the best I can do. Uh, there, believe me, there was no exaggeration in what we've told you today. Uh, and just from the health side, which people will make as a demanding thing, that's what their entry thing is, and when that's decreasing. The other thing, too, is we're having more and more public health emergencies. Um, <clears throat> certainly after, after Katrina came through, immediately became a man-made disaster because all that data was there, nobody heeded it. But the public health infrastructure worldwide, but certainly in the United States, is, I mean, even the aquifers for, for Washington, D.C. were built in the 1800s, and they've never been looked at since. So it's, it's um, gladly Obama administration is putting money into it. I don't think there's enough. But if we do increase the public health infrastructure, we'll increase the capacity to handle the new, the new surge with that. Uh, right now, I think our public health infrastructure is at, at the limit or it doesn't exist in some places.
best I can do. I hope you can do better than I. Dan, I'm going to give you the last word. Oh, that's very nice. Well, hooray. Um, uh, I, uh, I would only add a, 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 a small point that relates to what we've been dealing with in the last two days, and at some measure, at some, at some degree, it's been about interpolating between the perspectives of um, uh, people who are, um, like Skip, involved in, in public health and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and, and science of, of the phenomena that we're speaking about, and largely a number of scholars in the social sciences. And I would say that one of the important things to take into account here, because your question is incredibly important, is that uh, rather than seeing um, what the, the situations we've been talking about as discrete instances and discrete cases, in the social sciences, we've come to understand this as a systemic crisis, both the environmental one and the political one in, in the case of post-conflict environments, megacities, et cetera. This represents a lot, by and large, the consensus, this represents a systemic crisis. And what does that imply for us in, in, in a closed system? Um, it implies that uh, two things in particular. One is that technocratic solutions will not work, that there isn't any particular, there may be good indicators, but there isn't going to be any particular series of technocratic uh, infrastructural solutions. And largely they won't work because the biggest challenge that the con contemporary conditions of crisis represent are, are ones to, are the, are to the political order, which is structured in such a way as to be incapable of dealing with them. In other words, the emergent politics of the emergent emergencies is such that the they will demand a different kind of politics altogether than the one that exists in the present. Let me just make a point that being an environmentalist, I'm not suggesting anything that you would not have read or heard before had you read Garrett Hardin's article in 1968. This is exactly the position he advanced in the tragedy of the commons. It's just that the social sciences and many, many other thinkers have come T taken a very long time to understand the kind of it was it's kooky in many respects, but e extremely important in uh, working out the implications of that kind of an argument in the present. His concern was overpopulation or population growth, but we've discovered that at some level the assumptions that he that he that he presented about the incapacity of the world to contend with the the challenges that it was now facing in, along, in, along those axes, largely because of the anarchy that dominates the uh, system of states and international politics, really applies in all of the situations that we're speaking about now as well. What's interesting about this and what really motivates a lot of us who have been involved in this project is the fact that we're actually looking quite closely at what we think this new politics that it's creating might look like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I. Um Everybody have a good weekend after that talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.